Hello, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you today for, for the webinar um, in anticipation of the event that we're organizing in, in Amsterdam in February of next year, uh, which is our Making Solar Bankable uh, in Emerging Markets events focusing on uh, evolving business models. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with you uh, today. Um, we have a, an opportunity to look at uh, a number of different topics um, related to, yeah, the future of emerging markets or PV uh, solar in emerging markets. Uh, so we're very excited to be here today. Um, we have a, a pretty interesting program with a number of different uh, speakers uh, that you can see on your screens now. Uh, first of all, my name is uh, Borja Gutierrez. I'm a team leader here at uh, Solar Plaza of our emerging markets and finance team. Uh, responsible for our portfolio of events in emerging markets, uh, one of which is uh, an event, of course, that we will talk a little bit more about that we co-organize with with our partner FMO uh, for the second edition of uh, one of our most successful events in the portfolio of events, which is Making Solar Bankable, uh, the second edition I'll tell you about in a minute. Um, uh, um, my short introduction will be followed by uh, a presentation by Javier Relancio, uh, who uh, basically is, is a solar program leader in Mount McDonald. Um, he, his presentation will be followed by Ana Verena Lima, who's South America lead analyst with uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Uh, and finally, uh, our partner for this uh, event, uh, Frederick van Palant, who's a manager of the energy department uh, for FMO uh, with focus on Asia. Uh, so we have a very extensive global uh, coverage, uh, I think, for this event, some very interesting speakers. So uh, just quickly before we start, a few practical notes. Um, this will be an interactive uh, webinar. We'd love to encourage you all to, to ask questions uh, throughout the webinar. Uh, just to be clear, we, we will go through you know, our three presentations first uh, and, and leave the Q&A to the end. Um, but please, please, throughout the webinar, at any point, you can, you can ask us if you have any questions related to the content. But also, if you have any technical issues or anything, please feel free to, uh, to uh, put your questions into the, the question box, which uh, you should be able to see on the right side of your screen uh, within this GoToWebinar uh, tool. Um, also, I would like to, uh, to also uh, remind you that the presentation slides and recording uh, will be made available to you after the webinar, so we will we'll share with you uh, with, the, with the means to be able to get to those, uh, those slides. Um, so just very quickly, as I mentioned, this, this, uh, this webinar, which will focus on how much, uh, you know, the question that we're asking is how much solar can emerging markets actually handle? And of course, it's a very subjective and open question, uh, which we'll, uh, you know, elaborate more in a, in a minute. But this is really an anticipation, as I mentioned, of, of this event, Making Solar Bankable, which, we, which is a biannual event uh, the Solar Plaza co-organizes with the FMO. Um, and, and we'll be yeah, carrying out the second edition of this event uh, in, in February 2018, on the 15th and 16th of February in, in Amsterdam. Uh, and the goal really here is, is to bridge the gap between solar projects and capital uh, by getting everyone in one room. Uh, so we aim to have 500 plus developers, uh, investors, financiers, all the key stakeholders in developing solar projects in, in emerging markets uh, with you know, a key, key focus on, of course, matchmaking and networking with, with the goal of um, you know, moving uh, you know, closing projects and, and getting, uh, you know, deals financed. Um, and also with regards to the program itself, we'll be looking at, uh, you know, a mixture of, of different um, scenarios in which, in, in, in which uh, you know, financing issues uh, occur. We'll look at, uh, you know, how, how, what the state of solar is in emerging markets and several other very innovative topics. Uh, and, and this, uh, as I mentioned, will be taking place in Amsterdam. Um, just quickly, as I mentioned, it is uh, a second edition of an event that we co-organized in uh, February of 2016, uh, a bi biannual event which we organized. And in this first, you know, on your screens, you see a few statistics from that first event. Um, you know, it was, it, I think, from the expectations, uh, you know, as a first-time event, you never know what to expect. We had a huge uh, global attendance uh, from, you know, people from, from over 45, uh, 44 countries attending. Uh, you know, so very, very interesting distribution as well of, of, of types of people. We got great uh, reviews. Uh, you see some of the, the testimonials of people, what they experienced last time. Uh, and of course, we, we, you know, aim and strive to, to make it even more relevant and interesting as, as the industry also evolves. Um, and also, as you, just to give you a sense of the types of people that were there, uh, as you see, we had a, a very good division between sort of on the one side, financing and investment, and, and, and sort of, you know, having project developers and, and NG utilities, IPPs, sort of, you know, connecting with each other and, and all of uh, the other industry facilitators around that. Uh, and as you can see, also very high level 
uh, of attendance in in uh, in the company. Uh, just very quickly on on Solar Plaza for those of you that that don't know us, um, you know we're we're uh, basically a company that's or that organized uh, events since uh, 2004, specifically focusing on. Uh, on solar PV, um, our team, as I mentioned, we really focus on emerging markets and, and particularly on, on finance-related topics. And as we see, one of the major challenges. Uh, and, and yeah, we've worked in over 25 countries. Uh, we continue to do these events. And, and as I mentioned, the the, the event that we co-organized with uh, with FMO, which is this Making Solar Bankable event, is one of the uh, the most important uh, within our portfolio. Um, so the first speaker that we actually have with us uh, today uh, is Javier Relancio. Uh, he works with uh, with Mark McDonald's. He's actually, in fact, their, their African Solar Program leader. Uh, he's based in Cape Town. Um, we've worked with uh, with Mott in, in in well other events that we've done in Africa and other areas, uh, and and really has a very extensive experience, uh, you know, throughout Africa, uh, working with with different you know a number of different governments, a number of different uh, institutions and stakeholders, um, you know, relevant to to the growth. Uh, so playing a very influential role uh, in the growth of solar in, in Africa. And he he basically would like to to spend some time to share with us a, a few of their. Uh, their findings, um, and yeah, it would be really yeah. So I'd I'd love to uh, basically pass the floor over now uh, to to Javier. Uh, so I'll just activate his microphone. Uh, Javier, are you with us? Um, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Thank you very much, uh, Javier. I've also passed over the uh, the the role of well, you're able to you should be able if all goes well to change uh, between slides, and if not, let me know and I can do that for you. Uh, but yeah, I would love to give the, the the floor to Javier. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Borja, um, and indeed, thanks very much for uh, allowing us to present at this webinar. It's uh, it's great to to have the chance to, to present to the audience. Uh, today we are going to be talking about the sustainable growth of solar hybrid and energy storage systems in emerging markets. Um, I don't know if I can move the slides. It doesn't look like it, Borja. Right. Mm. Okay, it just looks like there is a little bit of delay. So uh, yeah, I'm going to be looking at it from, uh, or we are going to be looking at it from some different angles. Uh -huh. um, before we do that, I'm going to quickly uh, introduce uh, Mott McDonald. We are an uh, employee-owned business with over 17,000 staff located worldwide in across uh, all the different continents. It's worthwhile mentioning at this stage that actually in this presentation there has been inputs from uh, different locations across the globe and also from uh, different teams, including the energy advisory team, including the grid, uh, grid integration team and uh, solar team and the energy storage team. We are working across um, all of those uh, technologies and also many others. And we are also a multi-sector company, which I'm not going to get into. Um, our key services, again, are provided in this slide, which will be circulated later, and we are more than happy to respond to any queries that the audience has. Uh, we have, as you have uh, said before, as a company, a broad experience in uh, renewable energy projects. We have been working in, uh, in various projects across all different locations in the world. Um, these also include, as you can see in this uh, reference list, some hybrid systems and systems already with energy storage. and um, as I said, uh, in different roles across different locations. Um, I'm not going to introduce Mod McDonald for any further. If anybody from the audience wants to contact us, uh, there is my contact details at the at the end of the presentation. Uh, now talking about the key considerations for sustainable growth of solar hybrid and, uh, and energy storage in emerging markets, we have identified three different angles that we are going to briefly analyze in the in the next slides. Um, from a policy and legal framework perspective, we have seen that, uh, well, my, my experience is mostly in Africa, but I think uh, that from my colleagues that work in, in other emerging mar markets, this is mostly the case. Where there is good policies, this is uh, the main driver to attract uh, interest and to uh, create market confidence for inverter, investors and, and lenders. So it is very important that the policy is clear and it's published and known to everybody and it, it is aligned across all the stakeholders in the, in the uh, country, so that includes uh, the different government um, departments, it includes the utilities, the regulators, and all the different stakeholders that will have a say in the project. 
uh, the legal frameworks need to be in place and they need to be satisfactory again for international standards. So things like the PPA, the implementation agreement, um, the grid code and, and all of these documents uh, have to be robust. The country has to have clear plans on where it wants to go and a long-term view uh, rather than, uh, you know, like changing ideas over what they want to do. And it needs to be, again, known to the industry so that people can plan accordingly. The procurement processes, we have seen much more success where these have been open and transparent. And if particularly for larger scale projects, but also we are seeing these in uh, smaller projects, the off-takers risk seems to be uh, something very important for the investors and the lenders. Final consideration needs to be given to what we call the triple bottom line, which is uh, that balance between financial, environmental and social requirements and incentives to, to drive a good policy for the country. It goes without saying that uh, bad policies can have a detrimental effect and unsustainable growth. Um, it is very, very important that lessons learned from other international markets are put in place in, in every new country that wants to implement these. And uh, again, there is a lot of uh, registers of lessons learned. We have uh, supported many countries and we have our own, but I'm sure that uh, there is uh, a lot also in the public domain. Um, Another angle that we would like to look at is from the industry and uh, technology. And here it is really, really important that uh, there is alignment between the in-country capabilities and the expectations that any country that is going to develop uh, these markets has and the sustainability of the global industry. So uh, it is clear that technology industry and intellectual property have brought growth to, to many countries. And uh, uh, we see in many cases that they are inclined to bring local manufacturing, distribution and service offering, uh, considering that this will bring growth to the economy and also mitigate logistic challenges and, um, and potentially reduce costs. This depends very much on the country. However, it is very important that the uh, sizing of the local versus the global market, uh, it's, it's clear and the expectations are met. For instance, um, it, is not, it, doesn't, it might not make sense uh, that in a small market of, say, a couple hundred megawatts, they are expecting from the market that there is going to be a manufacturer that it's going to settle there. And, uh, however, it would make sense in that case even that things like the O&M contractor or the asset management is done in country and uh, that would also create jobs and capabilities in the country and potentially at a reduced cost. For that, uh, there will still need to be training of the local capabilities and all of these things need to be considered in the, in the policies. Something that definitely in most cases will need to happen is that the industry of the country needs to be prepared to a certain extent for uh, receiving these projects. So things like um, industry capabilities need to be developed in the short, mid and long term, sometimes before the, the programs is, are implemented. And it is important for the global industry that there is access to the local machinery and skilled and unskilled labor. Another aspect to consider is the technical standards, which we normally recommend to the local countries to embrace standards that are internationally recognized in order to allow manufacturers to plan for the various markets rather than to have to adapt the designs for each specific market. Um, the other angle is from an investor's perspective. And we believe that uh, emerging markets, I mean, this is, uh, has been heard before, have, have a huge potential. There is also some uh, saturation of the less developed, sorry, more developed markets, which is attracting a lot of interest to, to developed markets. And uh, this comes at different uh, sizes of investors due to the scalability of, uh, of solar projects. It can be from small investments to large investments. On any of those, we have seen a lot of motivation and action from DFIs and IFIs that have a strong interest in investing in these markets, but also driving them. We think that part of this is uh, because of the um, also good name that grid technologies have that are attracting a lot of interest from, uh, from a lot of international uh, countries. Um, what we have seen, and uh, this is more of a positive note, is that many countries are progressing in terms of the policies and frameworks, and uh, we keep seeing some countries doing very good uh, steps in the right direction. Um, as I said, my experience is mostly based in Africa, but uh, from my uh, colleagues in other markets, I understand that the same thing is occurring. Some of the challenges that we should consider, though, it's um, uncertain policies and roadmaps. So it has happened before that uh, a country starts with a policy and there is uncertainties along the 
behind and the roadmap is not as clear and this generates market uncertainty and doesn't it detracts investment um, it needs to be in order to manage the expectations we need to clearly understand properly the LCOE for the different uh, technologies and projects and planning the long term sometimes uh, certain technology might be perceived a little bit more um, costly and in the long term it, it actually makes a lot of sense um, integrating PV in grids can also be a challenge, but we believe that this can be mitigated with hybrid projects and uh, the off-take protection, we have already discussed it, as well as the local challenges uh, in, in the different markets. Um, from uh, solar PV and hybrid technologies for on-grid uh, systems, we believe that this can, again, um, add value to different stakeholders in the market. Um, four of them are listed below. I'm going to go uh, onto each of them uh, one by one to explain uh, our point of view on how hybrid systems can help. From a generator perspective, they can increase the capacity factor of systems by uh, having multiple source generators that, uh, and, and even storage so that there is guarantee that there is energy at all times during the day. And also, so thanks to the storage, you could avoid the fluctuation due, due to trips and avoid damping and curtailment in the case of uh, mostly of solar projects. Um, another thing that it will unlock is the use of time of the day tariffs. So if, uh, if you can use storage, you can then store your uh, energy and use it at the time of the day that, uh, that you would otherwise pay for, uh, for the higher price of electricity. This will then allow you to maximize yield and potentially also revenue. Um, from the perspective of the grid, um, there is two different aspects, the grid support and the grid utilization. From a grid support perspective, hybrid systems with energy storage can allow voltage control, frequency control, and the ability to hold cascading grid events, uh, which is very important for the grid operators, in particularly in emerging markets. And uh, from a grid utilization perspective, thanks to hybrid systems and different sources of renewables, uh, these can also become dispatchable with energy storage. This will uh, allow for the energy to be produced at the moment that it is needed the most and to also alleviate constraints across the grid. Where there is a, where certain countries are embracing embedded generation, and we are seeing this in South Africa quite often, uh, the, this also provides a decentralized and localized response that um, also avoids transmission losses and avoids the congestion of certain areas of the grid that are otherwise uh, difficult to evacuate solar power. Sorry, this got stuck. Okay, there we go. From a consumer perspective, uh, there is many different angles that, uh, that consumers can benefit from hybrid systems and solar systems. Some of the ones that we are seeing the most here in South Africa and in other emerging markets that we are working are uh, to withstand power blackouts, to uh, mitigate the price fluctuations of energy in the future, in many cases to reduce their cost with solar already being competitive in, in, in many cases against the grid, the concept that is called grid parity. This is actually supported by the fact that with uh, energy storage, they can use the batteries to avoid buying electricity from the grid in the most expensive times of the day. And also they can receive benefits in their invoices from a capacity charge reduction perspective and power factor correction that can be motivated in the, in the costs. Um, some points to comment is that uh, the capital cost of consumer generators have reduced a lot uh, with consumers rich, but there is also the concept of uh, energy as a service coming into embedded generation. So yeah, there is a lot of possibilities for consumers. From a government perspective, the uh, embedded generation and hybrid system can allow for um, the capacity to grow in a scalable fashion and in a very quick timelines. So this uh, helps them to control the generation to meet uh, the demand profile in the in the country and the growth. Uh, another aspect is that this motivates smaller investors and smaller companies, which can help a lot with the expansion of the local industry. Um, some of the challenges that we have seen is the complexity of hybrid systems, which we are happy to help with, the uh, expertise in uh, in the countries and in the areas where the projects are being uh, implemented. The grid management from the utility perspective for smaller operators and in many cases where it is needed, willing uh, has become an issue. So what is fair to be charged by the grid to trans 
transfer the power from a location to another and, and be sold in a different location to where it is produced. Um, from an off-grid perspective, um, what we have seen is that it is a huge market worldwide. There is over 1.2 billion people that don't have access to electricity in emerging markets. Uh, we have seen that this is mostly in Southeast Asia and Africa, particularly in Africa. And um, there is the concept of, uh, well, there is different potential solutions that, uh, that can be looked at in order to bring electricity to, to the different uh, yeah, rural, rural areas. Um, we are going to focus in this presentation on mini grids. Um, mini grids are a thing of the present. That is one of the things that we want to highlight. The technology is available. There is a lot of uh, projects that have happened. Actually, um, there is about 22.5 gigawatts of mini grids that have been installed diesel based. But um, what we are seeing is that solar can already be more competitive than diesel and in many cases definitely more competitive than being in the grid. So we believe that there is a lot of potential for including renewable energy into this uh, mini grid and unlocking uh, many untapped markets and, and locations across emerging markets. Um, some challenges that are being faced with mini grids include the um, correct demand modeling, the selection of the generation sources, the what topology of systems shall I use, which technology. In many cases, uh, many of the considerations come with business models to be used and how to uh, make them in line with uh, the local context and the local capabilities in the areas of these uh, mini grids. Again, we have a lot of experience uh, in house and there is a lot of lessons learned. Uh, on this field, and unfortunately, it's not. I don't have enough time to to go into each of these uh, separately. Um, from an energy storage, and these are the last few slides. Um, perspective: uh, What is the role that it can play in potential uh, in emerging markets? There is very different technologies depending on the on the use, um, and this graph illustrates them very well depending on the capacity needed and the amount of energy that it is expected that the storage systems will, will deliver to the grid. Uh, what we have seen in general, though, is that uh, there has been uh, growth over the last few years and the expectation is that this is going to keep growing and the prices of storage are going to drop, allowing uh, much more um, plants to include storage or even the grid including storage by itself. Um, the in emerging markets where we see that storage can be helpful, and this graph illustrates it at different levels where the storage could, uh, could come uh, and, and be connected into the, into the grid, it's uh, to maintain the, support, the quality of supply, to avoid the blackouts, and um, also it is worth mentioning that for off-grid applications, it's, uh, it's fundamental to have storage. One aspect for those uh, deciding whether to implement the storage is that it is fully independent of uh, the generation sources, whatever it's installed later, it doesn't really matter. The challenges that it is facing is access to markets, so there is still uh, restricted incentives and not many countries have legal frameworks in place for storage. It needs to be properly understood in order to understand the interrelationship with other services. The environmental and social economical aspects are being developed and need to be taken into consideration for the technology selection. And finally, because there was all of these uh, different technologies depending of the use, there is varied CAPEX and OPEX and expectations need to be managed subject to which technology is better for, for each of the markets. Um, it, there is one last slide on what is the services that uh, are required for the sustainable implementation of these projects and of course for more McDonald, we would be happy with uh, with support with with any of these. I'm not going to go in detail again. If there is any uh, questions from the audience or anybody is interested in contacting us, we would be pleased to uh, to help with your projects or or to clarify any questions that you have. Thanks very much, Borhan. Thanks very much to the audience. Uh, thank you very much, Javier. No, very, very interesting. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we, we definitely and we have some questions coming in, and and, and I encourage you all to uh, to keep bringing in your questions. Um, we'll, we'll come back to those, but you, you touched upon some very uh, interesting points. 
um, you know, which we, yeah, we, which we, we're very happy to sort of discuss. I mean, obviously, your fo key focus is on Africa, but I think many of the points that you've uh, brought up are obviously very relevant, uh, I think, in any of the emerging markets that, that, that we look at. So, so definitely, I, I definitely want to come back to some of those, uh, those points that you raised. Um, but, uh, yeah, indeed, what I, what I would like to do now is, is to change, uh, you know, again, we'll come back to it, um, but I would like to move to, to our next speaker. Uh, so thanks again, Javier. I'll come back to you uh, in a bit. Um, but I would like to now pass the, the role of, uh, yeah, presenter over to, uh, to Anna. Uh, Anna is, um, you know, South America lead analyst with Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Um, yeah, as, as, as the title implies, yeah, her key focus is in, in South America. Uh, and she's the lead, lead analyst with, with that uh, region. Uh, she looks at a number of different, um, yeah, power markets in the region. She, she looks at everything from policy and regulation to financing strategies, you know, a wealth of, uh, of information around, um, you know the, the the yeah the growth of renewable energies uh, with some pretty interesting markets. Obviously, Latin America is another one, uh, another region where we see a lot of activity. Uh, I'm sure she'll she'll tell us more about it her uh, herself. Um, but yeah, I'd I'd love to pass over the 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 word to to Anna. So uh, hi, Anna. Do you are you with us? Hi everyone. Um, thank you. Also, thanks uh, Solar Plaza for inviting me. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, I'm the South America lead analyst at. Bloomberg New Energy Finance, and today I'm going to talk about the Latin America uh, solar, solar market, so I'll give you an overview about the market and also talk about the Bloomberg New Energy Finance perspective for the short and long terms. And yeah, uh, just a brief overview of, about Bloomberg New Energy Finance, uh, we are a, a department at Bloomberg that falls on new technologies for the power market, especially clean energy, and also for EVs, smart technologies, batteries, we have teams that focus on these technologies. In Latin, we are divided into regions, so I'm South America analyst here. So uh, we also have a good knowledge and very good uh, data and analysis on gas, power, on gas market as well. So, uh, talking about LATAM, what we've seen um, in the past, I I'm not sure if you guys can see this slide very well with the numbers, I cannot see here, but this is a chart of the, the investment numbers, the, the investment that was deployed in LATAM in the, in the clean energy market in the last seven years, so it was a uh, hundred billion dollars in the past seven years here. So it's interesting to see that in blue is the investments in in wind and in yellow it's in solar technology. So we see that these two technologies have gained more space uh, in the region year over year. And it's mainly because of the development of course of these technologies and mainly because of the auction systems that we see here in Latin mainly in Brazil, Chile, um, Peru, now Argentina as well, and Mexico. So, uh, as you can see, um, in the Middle East 2013, uh, it's when we, we see that the investments in solar starts to increase, and it's not a coincidence that at the same time that we see uh, investment, renewable investments increase in Chile. So, Chile today is the country, is the main hub for solar investments in Latin. Um, so let me change. The next slide uh, is the same numbers actually, but divided by country. The purple color is for Brazil, so by far the main market here for renewables. But uh, of course, that we've seen lots, mainly because of the size of the country, the auction system started much earlier than the other countries. But in green, in green and dry green is Chile. Uh, it, it, it's it's a very important country for renewables in the region as well. So we, we have a very interesting contrast between 2016 and 15 and 16. So the 15 year received uh, the highest amount uh, of clean energy investments of about 17 billion billion dollars. So but we saw a drop of 30 percent in investments in 2016 that with almost of uh, $12 billion of new capital deployed.
Can you can you guys see this slide, uh, the numbers? Because I cannot see it here. No, for, the, the numbers aren't actually working, so uh, unfortunately not. If you can talk us through those. Okay, all right, just to, to, to have an idea. All right, the the last chart, uh, it's the, the size of the solar market in Latin in terms of its capacity. So uh, the, the total is that we have three gigawatt of solar plants online here at the moment in the region. So in, in, in green, it's the share of the, of Chile. So Chile has 66% 6, 6, 6 of the PV plants installed in Latin and Chile, in, if that's in green. In gray, in gray uh, it's Honduras with 16%. Um, so then we have the other countries. So the charts on the right are the the capacity additions by year. So the same the same three gigawatt is installed, but by a year, how much of that was addition? So the, the, the highest one is 2016. So the, the, on, the, on the right is update, it's 2017. So 2016 uh, so far was, um, was the with most solar additions. And 84% 80, of the capacity added in 2016 for solar was in Chile. So now so far in Latin, we have um, around 433 megawatt of solar uh, plants were commissioned in 2017. And as I'm going to show later on, uh, we're expecting 1.8 this year, uh, like a bit more than, than last year. So uh, these are this is a snapshot of the main markets today for um, in Latin. It, unfortunately, you guys cannot see numbers, but uh, of course, uh, after this presentation of the webinar, we're going to share it with you, to you the, all, the, all the, the presentation with all the numbers that you can take a look. But these are the main countries for solar in terms of continent plants. So Chile, on, Chile and Honduras, uh, solar is the main technology among the other renewables. So in Chile, solar corresponds to 8% of all capacity installed. So the share in, of solar is the yellow in these charts. Uh, in Honduras, the around five, 500 megawatt of solar just commission represent 20% of the total installed capacity in the country, which is a lot. So in Mexico on the right, you see that in blue, it's the wind, the share of wind, of course, that we have much more wind plants commissioned in Mexico than solar, but we're expecting that solar is going to gain more share uh, in, the, in the coming years. That's what I'm going to show you um, a, a bit later. So, so uh, of course, that Chile today is the, main, is the main market, thanks to its plentiful natural resource, a stable uh, economy, and of course that because of the clean energy equipment costs falling, uh, the country has seen a major boom in new wind and solar capacity added over the past years. But uh, of course that the build out has had some uh, consequence to this market. So uh, this is, a, I'm going to show a case study uh, that I took from uh, a report that I, I published. Uh, uh, the report is mainly about the clean energy impact on the cheap grid and wholesale price because it's quite interesting to see that the country has so much potential to receive such amount of uh, investments, but of course at the grid, the country needs to be prepared to receive such amount of investments. It the same happen with Africa, the same have happens with China, for example, with curtailment. And we like the country really needs to uh, walk along the, the investors and try to prepare the country to receive such amount of investments for intermittent source that are mainly wind and solar. So this chart, uh, it's the it's the monthly generation of wind and solar and in blue and yellow compared to the spot price, the monthly spot price uh, in the seek system in Chile is that it's in the that, that's the region north of the six, six system in Chile. It's a very good for uh, renewable plants to be installed. 
And these two, um, no, this, these two spot price came from Diego Del Magro and Montesquieu notes. That the, the, the notes that are near to uh, this such concentration of renewables in that region. So as you can see, we see an uh, indirect relation between the increase on the wind and solar generation in a long time with the decrease on the spot price. So we see that it's dropping uh, the, the spot price in the country. But if we take a look, if we take this data and take a look at but by hour, if we look, look how, is the, how is the spot price generation hourly in month in Chile, you see that this correlation gets much clearer. So just for you to understand, these are the, um, I took, a month of each season in the, in the country. So, um, summer here uh, in the south in Chile is uh, between December and March. So, as you can see, here's the hourly generation of solar and wind versus uh, Diego de Almagro, the spot price, that's the line in, in uh, red. The other lines are the, the price of the same, the same uh, month, but for the previous years, when we didn't have that much uh, renewables being generated at that time. So as you can clearly see, for example, uh, for March 2016, September 16 on the right, you see a, a very clear the curve for the stock price in Chile. And prices are reaching zero in most of the, uh, almost all the days in Chile for these uh, nodes, price reaching zero, which is a problem for solar mushroom products and especially even for other merch products. And, and it's interesting that in Chile you are, even if you have a, a PPA with the regulated market, we are exposed to the spot price. So it's also a challenge for products that won in auctions, for example. So it's something, um, something that the, 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 the country has to address. So, and here's the curtailment. Um, the number of curtailment, uh, the power curtailment in Chile uh, between August 15 and September 16. So curtailment started, actually renewable curtailment started in Chile in August 15. Uh, on the left, in gray, is also a amount of wind and solar being curtailed, that were curtailed, but at that time they were uh, disposed and by technology, that's why it's in gray, but it's also for wind and solar. Uh, just for you to have an idea, uh, between August 15 and September 16, around 200 gigawatt of solar and wind generation went unconsumed in Chile, or curtailed. So it represents 5% of all such power produced during the same period, so it was a lot. And it's clear that curtailment um, also reflects the lack of, of available local transmission. So that's what, what the government is trying to, to, to understand and solve. So now the Chile, there are two huge transmission lines under construction. But of course, but the market is still uh, waiting for more, um, for more plans for the transmission system to be published and to put it uh, in practice in order to solve this problem for the, to, 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 in order to, to make the, the country to receive more renewable investment. So here's our short-term forecast. So at Bloomberg Energy Finance, we focus on short-term and term forecast for the, for the clean energy market. The short-term, we do it for uh, clean energy technologies, but the long-term is for the whole matrix. That's what I'm going to show in a few minutes. So this is the Latin solar capacity additions forecast. It's, uh, it, it goes by, by, it goes through 2020, the last, the last um, bars for 2020. The biggest one that you can see in this chart is 2018. So we are expecting that 2018, we will have around seven gigawatt of solar projects commissioned in the region. And most of these come from um, the projects that were awarded in auction in the region. So in blue, as you can see in light blue, is Mexico. So all, all of, most of all of these issues will come from the options that were awarded. In gray, it's um, it's for Brazil, and then in, in, it's quite interesting to see that we see Argentina uh, 
finally showing up in our forecast. Uh, we expect seeing around 700 gigawatt of solar capacity to be added in 2018. So just, uh, I don't have too much time more, but the, the last slide is this one. Uh, it's our long-term forecast. It's called New Energy Outlook. We do it every year. We finish the 2017 that we are going to launch it in New York next month. And probably in, for Latin, we are going to do a, um, an event to launch the new 17 in August here in Sao Paulo. Uh, so here's the, the difference between the, the, the Latin power metrics. In 2015, that's the pie, uh, is the pie chart on the left. In 2040, because this, lo this forecast is until by for 2040, so as you can see on the left, uh, on the around 370 gigawatt installed in, in Latin, we see that we are we are we rely a lot on large hydros in blue and natural gas in, in gray, mainly because of the Brazilian market for hydro Paraguay and other countries here in South America and for for natural gas mainly because of Mexico. So we see that the chart in the middle is the annual addition of capacity for this technology. So in yellow, it's, it's solar again. And we are not dividing here the utility scale and small scale. But I can see that around half of this solar capacity that we are expecting to be added to be early every year until 2003, half will be, will, will be for small scale PV. So we're expecting that this market is going to, to have a huge boom in the region. And it's quite interesting to note that in, in pink is the flexible capacity. So um, in, it includes batteries, it includes thermal plants, especially gas plants, to be dispatched on for demand response. So we also expect lots of uh, demand uh, flexible capacity to be added uh, in the coming years, uh, especially to to get this grid more stable and of course that we are also expecting these countries um, in order to, to be able to get a certain amount of uh, renewables. Uh, th that's what, what I've seen now that the country is trying to prepare the market for the future. It's trying to build more transmission systems to be able to receive such amount of investment in the country. So yeah, that's my uh, my presentation, and of course that you'll be able to have these, these slides at the end um, after the uh, the webinar. But if you have any question, if you want me to I don't know to, to to focus on any other topic that I can do it during my presentation, please uh, feel free to send me an email and and at, or even at, uh, before or after my presentation at the end of the webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, very interesting presentation. I just wanted to also apologize uh, to everyone watching the obviously the slides, the the numbers and and figures on those uh, slides weren't showing up. Something happened uh, in the transition of the slides, so uh, apologies for that. But as Anna mentioned, you will be able to to get the slides uh, from her and her teammates. Um, you can see her her email in this slide, but we will also share that with you. Uh, following the webinar, so you can also follow up uh, specifically to to uh, yeah to get those slides as well. So, but apologies for that. There is indeed a lot of data behind those, but, but great job, Anna, of explaining. Um, you know, the the without any of the numbers, the corresponding figures, it was really uh, great to understand. Um, you know, all of these trends. And again, uh, you know, I encourage you. We, we we're getting some quite some questions in. You know, to to keep asking these questions, whether it's about LATAM specifically or or other things, we'll come back to them. Um, so so yeah, our next uh, speaker is is Frederick van Palant. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning of this webinar that. that the event that this is uh, that this webinar is is in anticipation for making solar bankable. We are actually co-organizing with FMO. There are. Uh, co-organizing partner in this event as well as the last edition uh, and Frederick is, is uh, well the key contact for FMO and the organizing uh, committee uh, but more importantly Frederick is, is the, the manager at the energy department of FMO uh, focusing on, on, on Asia 
Uh, and yeah, so I'll, I'll let him explain uh, a little bit more where, where FMO uh, stands and, and what their uh, you know, thoughts are with regards to Asia and with regards to this topic of uh, you know, where, where solar is going in emerging markets. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to, to work with, uh, with Frederick and FMO on this, on this topic. And uh, yeah, very curious to hear what the situation is in Asia and how you see the, specifically with regards to the financing of these projects. So uh, yeah, I'd love to pass the word over to Frederick. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Borga. Um, well, as uh, Borga mentioned, um, FMO is a Dutch development bank. Um, we're a public-private partnership um, between the Dutch government and uh, the Dutch commercial banks. We uh, work globally in developing countries and emerging markets, and uh, we cover three sectors of which uh, the energy sector is one. We have been around for the past uh, 47 years, uh, but it wasn't until seven years ago or so that we made our first uh, solar investment, actually in a solar project in uh, Peru. Um, and uh, it wasn't until last year that um, FMO and um, Solar Plaza teamed up to um, co-host the first uh, Making Solar Bankable uh, conference, and we're very much looking forward to welcoming many of you also to the next edition in, uh, in next February. Um, with regards to the uh, energy side, we focus both on uh, on-grid and off-grid uh, projects, investing both um, across the, the spectrum in uh, equity and, and debt, and whereby uh, the matching of our financing to the project's needs is, um, is of the essence. But because we, uh, we have only one location, um, in, we're based in The Hague, the Netherlands, uh, we do have a satellite office in, in Joburg, but uh, most of our staff is based in, uh, in The Hague. We, um, we're quite uh, remote oftentimes from our projects. So when it comes to equity investments, um, we follow the following strategy. We typically invest in private equity funds, and those funds will invest either in smaller um, energy projects, solar projects, for example. Uh, if, if these uh, projects tend to be bigger, uh, we like to follow a uh, co-investment strategy uh, together with the funds. Um, on, the, um, on the direct side, uh, we, we provide uh, mezzanine and debt financing um, to, to both on-grid and uh, off-grid uh, projects, but we need a certain uh, a skill uh, and investment size so that uh, typically has restricted us uh, so far to doing mostly on-grid projects. They tend to be uh, bigger um, and that, that matches, like, let's say, the efficiency profile that we're looking for. But we're um, also very positive on, uh, on the um, developments on the off-grid side. And um, we have made available capacity since last year to actually uh, doing more and more investments in the off-grid space. Why are we um, enthusiastic about solar? Well, we, um, we, we think there are uh, several key advantages uh, that it brings. First of all, it's, um, it's quite, uh, 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 let's say, quick and, uh, and, and not so complex to implement as, an, a, power, uh, as a power generation solution. Um, so in, in, in comparison, for example, we, uh, we are also investing in hydro projects, which tend to take a long time to, uh, to build and uh, come with all kinds of uh, typically environmental social issues with solar that's traditionally uh, more limited. Um, with um, prices falling uh, over the past uh, couple of years, it also has been uh, become a much cheaper and so a much more interesting uh, proposition. Uh, thirdly, um, it's it's very flexible, uh, so uh, you can either go on grid or where the grid is not economically feasible, not there yet, you go off grid. Um, it's also scalable, so you can start with a certain size, but you can add up. And then, as Javier mentioned, eh, and also went into his presentation with uh, storage, um, the outlook uh, seems very uh, bright. Um, what um, what do we need as an investor? And I'll try to keep this very short because time is uh, uh, running out a little bit. Well, we need uh, bankable projects. And, and what does that mean, bankable projects? Well, first of all, we need projects. And what we found is that there is a lot of liquidity around, especially if you look at currently at uh, yields in OECD countries and uh, the attractiveness of emerging markets. Um, um, uh, there is liquidity, but um, what we found uh, there is actually 
uh, a lack of uh, projects and also competition for projects, both on the developer side as well as on the side of the financiers. Well, to help um, develop projects, we have engaged in two initiatives. Um, one is uh, Climate Investor One, which is a uh, fund that is uh, set up with both public money and private money to uh, cater to the development of uh, on-grid um, uh, solar amongst other solar projects and on the other side on the, uh, more, more uh, pertaining to the off-grid side we have um, uh, pioneered uh, Electrify uh, which is um, um, a, a fund which is based in Brussels which manages uh, uh, funds provided by the uh, Euro European Union um, as, as European development banks we uh, we are trying to assist uh, the smaller developers in uh, the off-grid space to develop to further develop their uh, projects and to um, enable them to reach um, such stage that DFIs or commercial banks can actually help uh, the further growth. Um, what um, what we need next is um, the right institutional environment. Javier also uh, talked about that quite a bit. So that pertains to the right, uh, let's say, uh, regulation and, and um, uh, institutional uh, framework in place, government capacity, um, and also government uh, expectations. Um, on the third, uh, what, what is important if we look at projects is uh, the demand supply equation that also Anna talked about. Um, we, 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 we like stability and yeah? that's also why uh, the institutional environment is very important when we look at it, but also uh, we need to have comfort on how the demand side and supply side is uh, developing in, uh, in countries. And that comes with uh, issues like curtailment, the affordability, uh, the level of end user tariffs. Um, so on, uh, on the demand supply side, um, there, there are various uh, macro uh, considerations. And then if you, if you spe specifically pertain to the on-grid side, if you take a talk about uh, offtake, uh, sorry, the, the demand side and uh, and project specific, uh, you you come to the offtake. Um, we uh, we are working in Asia in markets uh, where uh, yeah where where you have a market based uh, system, but we also work in uh, in countries. It's quite diverse in that regard, where you have um, either uh, feed-in tariffs or. Um, uh, privately negotiated um, uh, tender based situations and of course we we need to study the, the offtake situation and the reliability also of the offtake going forward um, then very important is uh, the aspect of project implementation um, we're looking for the right uh, parties in, in in the projects that we're uh, working with to implement the project and uh, when you talk about uh, project implementation as uh, Javier also mentioned uh, the environmental and social aspects of the of the project are very important. Uh, with uh, solar booming, uh, especially uh, what we have seen in, uh, in a country like India, uh, or in an in a uh, context of Bangladesh, for example, uh, land use is becoming more and more important, uh, and also constraining to uh, project development. Um, next to that, uh, the buy-in and expectations from local communities. Is also getting more and more uh, important as uh, they are becoming also more and more vocal. Um, and then, uh, and then finally, we of course look at the economics of the of the project. Um, what we have seen is, of course, um, many countries that uh, that have uh, either announced or have um, or, or where where developers have tendered on uh, on projects with tariffs uh, that are quite low. Um, I think in India, uh, we've seen uh, in the latest round tariffs uh, between three and four cents, what we also seen in the Gulf. And what is very important, uh, that's also an important role that we have towards uh, the government, the, go the host governments, is that situations differ and that you cannot expect uh, the same tariff to apply to different countries, uh, which of course have very different situations. But um, we have seen and we have financed actually uh, in some environments projects that um, that got awarded based on, on quite low tariffs and that is um, stretching both uh, the return on investment for developers but also stretching financing structures and I think that's, uh, that's something that will continue to go ahead in the future 
um, and we um, I think we have an, an important role um, as a community to see how low can you go and how to safeguard also the economic viability of projects. Um, well, very brief note on, on, on Asia because it's, it's very large and I, I didn't bring uh, slides precisely because of the issue that Anna ran into just now. Um, but the, the region is quite diverse where we see most action at the moment in, in solar is of course uh, India. We're also actively looking in uh, at projects in, uh, in Bangladesh and we're very uh, eagerly waiting um, you know, developments in, uh, in Vietnam going forward. We also think that Nepal has a very interesting uh, proposition resource, especially because it's quite dominated by uh, hydro and, and solar uh, can, uh, can provide like a good uh, substitute to that. Um, and we are eagerly awaiting, let's say, developments in, uh, in Pakistan. Just a few um, uh, yeah, countries that I uh, singled out, but very, very eager to further discuss and answer any questions that you, you have. Um, and I would say, hopefully, we will be um, seeing each other in, uh, in February next year at uh, our joint conference in Amsterdam. Thanks, uh, Borja. Thank you, Frederick. Uh, yeah, very, very interesting uh, overview from, from all three of you. Uh, again, yeah, thanks to all of you who have been sending your questions. Probably we're not going to have a chance to get through all of them. Uh, but still, if you have more questions coming up, please still keep sending them in. We can, of course, carry these uh, these conversations on, you know, offline. Um, but yeah, so, so you know, moving into, uh, and, and in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to activate all, uh, you know, Anaf, uh, Frederick, Javier, and and Rick, all of you will be able to, to sort of speak freely. I might direct questions specifically to, to one of you uh, here and there, but I'll unmute all of you so you're able uh, you know, to, to join the conversation. Um, but one thing I'd first like to ask is with regards to, um, yeah, I mean, basically one of the things we obviously see is, is a tendency uh, for pricing to, to obviously decrease. I mean, you, you know, this has been mentioned in several uh, presentations that we see, you know, prices go extremely low. Uh, I'm actually curious to, to see where, you know, each of you thinks that, that prices might end up, I mean, whether it's in your respective regions, and I realize this is a very, very, uh, you know, open question. It depends on so many factors. But generally, I mean, do we see it? We're, yeah, we're seeing sort of three cents, uh, uh, you know, prices in, in, in many, even in emerging markets, whereas, you know, a few years ago, people were saying, oh, anything below 15 cents, is uh, it's impossible. Um, yeah, maybe I can start with Anna. Anna, what do you think? Do you, do you see the prices continuing to, uh, to decrease further in, in Latin America, where you're focusing? Yeah, uh, it's a very interesting question because um, there are some uh, points that that worth mentioning. Uh, the first one, the price that we've seen in auctions in the region, of course, that uh, most of you can remember the $29 per megawatt hour that we saw in the past auction in Chile from a solar pack project. So, uh, of course, that we've seen $27 uh, for solar project in Mexico as well. Uh, in Argentina, because of the cost of financing, because of other Asian country, the prices are not that low. But of course, that we've seen a tendency of decrease on on for solar project, especially in auction uh, in Latin. It's mainly the, the main reasons for that is the decrease capex. So, for example, it's it's quite interesting to to it's important to understand that the twenty nine dollars that we saw in Chile. Uh, is for the, a project that has to start operation in 2021. So when they were uh, doing their offers, they were expecting, they were projecting capex. So they were using, assuming capex of uh, near 2021 is not the same that we are seeing today in the in region. And another point to, to also compare is the capacity factor that caused that in Chile and, and Mexico were just amazing for solar projects and wind as well. And, uh, and of course, that the, the, the auction system um, is more stability for the, for, the, for the owner and for the banks to be uh, financing. It's more like stable contracts, a long-term contract. So it can bring the, 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 the price uh, down. So that's the point. But at Bloomberg New Energy Finance, we, do, we also do cast of LCOE for, for a year after, like 2018, for example, the last one that we published. And we've seen 
low price but not that low price that we saw in auctions the low case is the low case for project starting construction uh, starting operation in 2021 so the reality for 2018 is around 50 dollars megawatt hour in chile it's a bit more in brazil it depends on the market okay th thanks very much anan um yeah maybe just to compare that with with africa let's say uh javier what, what how do you see uh, prices developing in in upcoming uh, uh projects yeah, I think that the, the points that Anna has, has mentioned are very relevant here as well. I think that, uh, and, and it was one of the uh, things that I mentioned in my in my presentation of managing the expectations of each of the of the different countries, and uh, it is from different angles. But some of them are indeed the uh, the timelines associated to the projects and when are these going to be developed. Others are accessibility to low local infrastructure and industry, and also even logistical challenges or, or taxation and, and this sort of thing. And then uh, something that plays also a big role is incentives. Some, some of the markets have provided strong incentives also in the form of grants for the establishing renewable energies, and, and that also has driven the cost down. So I think it is very important that uh, we compare apples with apples and, and uh, we do a fair or we have a fair expectation of what prices are going to be achieved in, in every market. This being said, overall, as an industry, the prices of, uh, of solar are decreasing year by year, and this is, a, this is a fact, which is what is allowing us to reach lower prices. Now, um, I, I expect that in the future, not meaning that I expect that the next projects in one country are going to be necessarily lower cost than uh, than those in a, in a different country it, it just depends on each market okay interesting and uh yeah maybe then for the for the well and also the investment side perspective but Frederick, how you see things in asia and generally uh, developing yes and i also saw a question uh, whether we finance pv projects in latin america and that's that's the case like we also finance uh, projects in africa and latin america it uh, just happens to be that I cover Asia. No, I uh, very much agree with um, Javier and Anna. Um, I think as an investor, what you would like to avoid is um, uh, too high of a price, uh, too high of a tariff, and on the other hand, too low of a tariff. Um, so for example, in Mongolia, um, we, we are looking at projects that at, at the current level um, that, that has been provided by the government, we think uh, will 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 be difficult to finance because they typically have the, the the level that Jordan started with a few years ago, around 16 cents. Uh, on the other hand, uh, some of the projects that um, that were won, for example, in the Gulf or um, maybe very recently also in India, it, we have to wait and see whether they actually will be built. But more importantly, it's also looking through, as uh, Javier said, um, what is actually being provided here and whether we actually compare apples to apples. In some cases, the land is provided free. India works with a subsidy scheme, for example. And also in the some of the Gulf projects are different tariffs uh, that are not published, but uh, different tariff structure so that the end tariff differs from that uh, what uh, was announced. Um, also agree that uh, we need to brace up to a future where uh, we will um, have to um, live with a low uh, tariff environment or lower tariff environment but yeah we also as a financing uh, community we can only finance it on on the basis of certain principles and if it's not financially sustainable then it's just not going to fly i think interesting point so it, it seems like a lot of you concur and indeed yeah so the, the low prices is just something that we we seem to have to to just uh, deal with essentially and 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 work our business models and financing models around that um so i'm curious that you know as a, as a sort of follow-up question to that uh i mean yeah so so we see this Do, uh, what obviously the the margins are, are really decreasing you know for developers investors um maybe maybe first i'd like to ask this question to to javier because you, you sort of touched upon all these new new models and also keeping in mind that i know all three of you uh you know have initially predominantly focused uh, almost exclusively on utility scale uh, and we've had you know separate conversations and I see in, in all of you that you know increasingly off-grid is a big part of of your focus of your of your you know portfolio or wish portfolio um, I mean yeah so Javier do you see with the, with this uh, yeah with these drops in prices and the margins being very low do you see that the sort of the traditional let's say the pure project developers of the past that really focused on just developing projects do you see that they're 
basically going to have to re reinvent themselves and, and uh, make you know offer energy as a service or other types of innovations to to, to make to, to stay alive um, I think it's a it's a very very uh, interesting question that you raised Borja um, I don't necessarily see it as needing to adapt themselves necessarily I just think it is another new market that that is racing and it is being uh, yeah, it's becoming available indeed, among other things, due to the um, lower prices that we are seeing in the market, but also due to advances in technologies, due to better understanding of the business models, and, and many, many different considerations. Uh, bear with me that in many cases, what it is unlocking more mini grids and, uh, and access of renewables to rural areas is as well methods of pavement and understanding better the business models on how to uh, you know, for the local communities to embrace renewable energies, and this plays a very, very important role. Um, we indeed, uh, we discuss, as, as you know, with uh, many utilities that are working at different levels in the industry, and we see certain utilities saying, no, we're going to remain focused on larger scale projects, and, uh, and you know, like being in that, in that fight, but there is many others that are definitely coming in with uh, in some cases, creative ideas on how they can uh, access these these other markets. We believe that, that it's going to be a, a mix of things with uh, utilities in, in the many fronts and, and different companies in the mini fronts, different fronts. But the mini grid, until now, it has been mostly dominated by smaller companies. In many cases, uh, even NGOs or social enterprises. And we we do expect that there will be more utilities being interested in in that front and larger companies definitely. Interesting. Maybe Anna, do you have any any further elaboration on this? Yeah, uh, just to add uh, to what Javier said, uh, I, I think that at the end, the the, the whole market must be re reinvented. Uh, the, the the market has to to get adapted to new intermittent source being connected to the grid. Uh, so the governments must follow this this trend uh, by providing more a better infrastructure. To, to receive some term out of terms and source being connected as well as new technologies with batteries, uh, with flexible capacity, demand response, and so on. So, uh, especially for, for LATAN, I can say that for each scale, the biggest barrier to this is the transmission system capacity and uh, a very good um, like connection between uh, terms and source and, and, and batteries, the price of the batteries, and so on. I think that. In the midterm, we're going to have a better sense on this, how the government, how the, the regulators are going to work with renewables and investors trying to get the best uh, from these, these new tenders, uh, that's investment in terms of source, mainly because of the environment and because of the price, they are getting very competitive uh, when we compare uh, solar and wind to other sources. And the other point is that for, for uh, mini green smart grid, I think it depends a lot on the government as well to to plan uh, how how it's going to be how it's going to be the structure of the power market in the country in terms of uh, limiting uh, where it's going to be uh, where it's going to go the transmission line and until what, which point we are going you can put a mini grid without like ten years later you have like a transmission line being connected and then you lose your or that you have you all the investment that they have deployed in the past. So I think that the, the, the market is, is getting adapted, is, get, is still getting used with this new business model. So yeah, I think it's, 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 uh, it's changing right now. Interesting. Borja, can I, can I add something there on that, on that front just very quickly? Of course. Um, that, that is indeed one of the, that is indeed one of the aspects that was in uh, my presentation as one of the challenges for mini grids, which I didn't unfortunately have the, the chance to expand much on, on them. And um, I, I'm talking about the uh, putting together a mini grid and then the grid eventually reaching that, that area where the mini grid had been implemented. Um, we actually have had a lot of conversations internally and with uh, companies developing mini grids, and we believe that subject to the design of the mini grid already taking the, that possibility into consideration it's actually going to add value to the to the community and to the grid in any case by um, allowing for more centralized decentralized response closer to the community 
and also allowing for the storage to then become sort of like a potential support in case of uh, blackouts or for ensuring the quality of service. So we think that there is indeed some, again, new technologies that are considering that scenario and it shouldn't put uh, anybody off from considering a mini grid even if in five, ten years time the grid might reach those, those locations. Interesting. Yeah. No. Thanks. Thanks for adding that. That's a that's a very interesting point, and and I know that you're doing a lot with uh, with regards to really uh, looking at, at these different growth scenarios and how how that might work. So very interesting. Uh, Federica, maybe with a slightly different, and of course, feel free to to uh, uh, to sort of elaborate on this. But I'm also curious. I mean, with regards to sort of the financing of, of projects, obviously as a uh, as a financier, in some cases, investors you're providing equity. Uh, you know, the margins for you and you're you're a development bank, so it's it's arguably the of course the impact of your investments are very important. But um, yeah. What do you see as a sort of long-term uh, progression of that? Do you see more commercial banks coming in? Uh, you know, can they come in with with uh, with these uh, smaller margins, or same with, with sort of equity investments? What types of inv investments would you see in in, in the long run? Well, I think in, in the countries where uh, we've seen a steep drop in, in tariffs, I, I think that also has gone hand in hand with uh, participation from um, local financial players, um, commercial banks, for example, now picking up the whole, pretty much all of the project finance transactions in uh, India. Um, capital market development to accommodate that. Um, but for that, you really, for that, you really need skill. Um, skill both in let let's say the underlying uh, projects, the, the the asset base, and also of the the, the financing uh, side. Um, I, I think what what is um, something that we we see as a consideration right now, especially in uh, off grid, is that um, it, it's still early days. Um, the the companies are still quite small. Um, it's 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 still like like we would say it's more venture than than growth uh, still, and and for us to 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 engage or for you know commercial investors to engage, I I, I think it's uh, it, it's also a matter of the investment size. So what we're looking at is um, to to get around it is to look at uh, portfolios or indeed to to match the early stage of the of these companies with with the right uh, product like equity, but then these are small investments still, um, and and we have to see whether it uh, it works out. We do see, uh, especially in some of the more mature markets, um, the event of utilities um, investing in some of these off-grid companies. Um, we're, we're now seeing business models quite interesting. You, you, you have the big question mark on the, on the addressable market, um, pretty much like you had in, in, in mobile telecoms uh, a while ago, where uh, you start with a certain segment of the population, but can really the, the rural communities, can they really afford um, you know, the energy that, that is being provided to them? And we see now the advent also of an, um, uh, like hybrid models where, uh, for example, uh, telecom uh, towers are provided by uh, by solar powered solutions. Um, at the same time, uh, small and medium uh, business enterprises are taken uh, along as as well as residential. So you see the uh, yeah like different segments being being combined, where you have a stability of some base revenues, which uh, makes it more attractive for commercial investors or, or development uh, financiers like uh, like us to uh, to get involved excellent thanks thanks very much Friedrich. um yeah i mean so 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 basically i, mean, I know we've covered a lot of uh, different a number of different topics you know ranging from uh, you know everything from all well, the, the latest thing was, was financing we were looking at different business models a lot of different segments I mean obviously we're answering a huge question here which is how much solar uh, can emerging markets actually handle and arguably we we haven't answered that and 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 there's so much uh, you know to be considered uh, especially when we're looking at things globally uh, obviously these are these are topics that we vary we as solar plaza and, and also with, with our partners FMO uh, you know follow
follow very closely. Um, there are several questions that have come in, which uh, you know we'd love to, to elaborate on and answer. I mean, there's questions just to give you you know some of you idea. I mean, there's specific questions regarding everything from you know specific markets like Iran, Bolivia, Algeria. Uh, there's you know questions regarding very specific uh, you know uh, yeah uh, just outlooks on specific markets. There's questions on on where th where trends are going. I mean, these are all things that we're going to be discussing obviously in 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 Amsterdam uh, February, and it's it's quite quite a way away. And obviously, we will be uh, you know running more webinars we'll be running a lot of content in the lead up to this event on on some of these topics um, again the the uh, webinar recording and, and the slides will be made available to you uh, again apologies that you know there were some issues with uh, with some of those slides again you will receive them with all the numbers all the information um, thank you so much to 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 all of our speakers uh, again if you do have any you know further follow-up questions you'd like to get put in touch with the speakers these types of things feel free to contact us um, and we really hope to, to, to see you all uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, there is sort of early bird pricing available now, and if, if you are joining with several people, you can contact us, and, and, and you know, we'd be more than happy to explain you know, more about the event and, and get your input as well. I mean, if you're interested on, on, on you know, providing input, we're, we're very much open. We rely on the industry uh, to be able to, uh, to, to get into all the topics that we do. Uh, and we have several uh, you know, upcoming events, uh, so please, please get in touch with us. Uh, we're more than happy to, uh, to, to follow up. And, and thanks once again to, to all of our speakers, Javier, Ana, Frederick. Thanks to all of you. Thank you to all of our attendees uh, and to all of you that, that are supporting, uh, that have supported our last edition of Making Solar Bankable and that are supporting this next upcoming edition. Uh, and look forward to being in contact with you all in the, in the coming weeks. So thank you once again. Thank you. Thanks very much, Borja, and everybody in the audience and in the organizing side. Thank you very much, uh, Borja, Ana, and Javier, and uh, looking forward um, to the next uh, step. Yeah. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you, Juan, and I, uh, I've been in the next event in Miami, so I hope to see some of you there. Excellent. Looking forward to it. A lot of great, uh, great uh, <laughs> upcoming things. So thanks to all of you. <laughs>